This week uh, in Ecclesiastes, um, just want to start by sharing it. It's going to be tough. I mean, this is just a, a really tough section of the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, we're going to be at the end of chapter 2. Uh, for some of you, uh, I've heard the, the conversations uh, throughout the week about... Uh, whether or not you should do something because what does it matter anyway? It's meaningless. Uh, uh, all of a sudden I'm grouchy and we're, you've got to give us some time to work through some of these. But at the end of the day, the past couple of weeks have been chipper and lighthearted compared to where Solomon goes today. He's going to ask uh, some tremendously difficult questions that, that you and I choose not to ask. We have them. But we don't ask them because they're really, really challenging. Um, if you've ever met a life coach, do you know what a life coach is? It's kind of a new thing. Uh, it's someone that can help guide you and like deal with life and break it down and help you be successful and healthy. And if you ask one of those folks, um, how do you eat an elephant? They're going to tell you one bite at a time and it's their analogy, their illustration, that sometimes life has these huge challenges to us that seem overwhelming. And the only way we can tackle them is one little piece at a time, to give one little success at a time. I'm kind of thinking that for this chapter, there's going to be some huge things that we choose not to uh, devour together today. But just take a bite. That's all we're going to be able to do today is take a bite of some pretty massive things. So it got me thinking. Truthfully, as a pastor, I prefer the abundance of happiness and joy and didn't that feel great kind of Sunday mornings, right? Those are pretty popular. Um, They're popular for me. Uh, It makes me be liked a little more uh, when I just dole out some happy stuff. Uh, everyone leaves that. But isn't it true that not long after those happy moments, you roll back into your real life where there's struggles and, and you wonder about it all and you ask those deep questions to yourself as you're laying in bed at night that you don't dare verbalize to other people. Does life have meaning? What is the purpose? Does God care? Is God even there? Some of those big, difficult questions don't match up with a happy Sunday. It's appropriate to have joy and and celebrate, for sure. We do that a lot. But it's also appropriate sometimes to dive into some really difficult passages. One of the reasons I like to preach what pastors call exegetically, which means we take a section of Scripture and we're like, da-dunk, 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 all the way through it, is because it forces us to look at stuff that I wouldn't choose otherwise to look at. That's kind of where we are today in the last half of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. It's not going to be a candy pinata Sunday, all right? It's kind of like what I'm saying. But I do hope and I do trust that as Solomon asks his questions, and some of them reverberate in our soul, that... The Holy Spirit will unpack as He wishes to encourage, challenge, move you, and maybe even make us a little bit more like Jesus as He does that, alright? You guys in? So that, that was the preface. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 12. For those of you who have read through, uh, the Bible, It's just true. If you haven't read through the whole thing, it's okay. You still love Jesus. Like It's not a guilt thing. If you haven't read through the whole Bible, you don't realize how difficult it is um, to read some of the passages with kids near you. Um, When we went through, what was it, two, three years ago, we read through, um, there are some passages literally I was like, I kind of want to censor that. I I kind of don't want to move through that. Um, The Bible just has a way, all of life, God has some words and speaks into. And so here we go. Uh, Verse 12. It's going to do a little review for us. I, the teacher, 
Oops, sorry. Verse 12. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. He, he's looking back where we came through last week. And last week, if you remember, Solomon paints this picture of life. He's asking this huge question, is there any meaning to life? Is this uh, adventure rolling to any particular end to the story that's significant? And so he tests it. If you remember, he does these massive tests. The first one was pleasure. And so Solomon has all the resources at his disposal. He's wise, he's wealthy, he's powerful, and he's king over Israel. And he aims All of that towards pleasure, where every day he's seeking to to drink as much wine as he wants, to be with as many people as he wants. Um, He laughs, he brings in the comedians, the musicians are there. It's a constant party for Solomon. And, And at the end, he comes to this conclusion of, I got old. Like, even the most massive amount of pleasure that you and I can't even dream of, it got old. And he comes to that same conclusion of, man, it's meaningless. And so he moves on from this phase of pleasure to, to build something and do something and make an impact on the world. And he's digging reservoirs and he's planting like a national forest and he's watering it. He's building these massive homes. It took him 14 years to build his own home. He's making an impact a lasting legacy. And, and after a while, he comes to a conclusion of, I'm putting all this effort out. I'm toiling night and day. To what purpose? To what is this availing me? He comes to the same conclusion. It's not bringing meaning. It's meaningless. And so the third test he had, these sure sound like phases of life to me. Those younger years where it's just like me, I want pleasure, I I want to party, I I want to just go and experience new things. And then those middle years where we're like, I've got to work more and I work 55 hours. Oh yeah, man, I'm tired. I work 65 hours this week. And we're just committing ourselves to building and working. And and then we hit what I know a lot of you retired folk laugh at. Um, because it doesn't feel that way. Um, but that, that phase of life that culturally tells us we should sit back, take it all in. You've done your time. You deserve this. And Solomon takes that, that moment to just be what we would call hedonistic. It, it all becomes about him and what he sees. And we meet some of the uh, wives, at least the notion that he's married in. As he takes it all in, as he has this life of ease, kicking back. It's that time that when someone says, Solomon, this has got to be done. He's like, uh, I've got a guy for that. You know, talk to him. Everyone's doing everything for him. And at the end comes a very familiar conclusion. This isn't doing it. It's not providing the measure of significance for his soul. And so he summarizes That all of it is a chasing after wind. Becomes a a boring, predictable, meaningless life for the king with everything at his disposal. And so he asks at the end of verse 12, what more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? Meaning, you want to try to match what Solomon just tested? Like, maybe we're sitting here thinking, yeah, but he didn't have access to the internet. And, and Solomon's like, seriously? I had way more access to way more information than you ever had. I had way more opportunities to just dilly-dally through the day than you could ever dream of. My parties were bigger. The things I accomplished, not even a small portion will you ever be able to accomplish. Whatever you and I might try to do to find satisfaction in life, Solomon is saying, I've already been there multiplied umpteen times. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So, in verse 13, I saw that wisdom 
is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes on his head while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. He's beginning to say, there's a temptation out there, right? Maybe if I just ignore it all. Like maybe if I don't ask the question, then I don't need to to ponder all of this. And Solomon says, to not ask these questions, it's like closing your eyes like a blind man racing through a room full of furniture. It doesn't go well. Light is a good thing. Opening our eyes is a good thing. How many of you have ever said, look at that fool. He's working the excavator with his eyes open. What oh, fool that guy is. Right? We don't go there. We're like, no, paying attention to what you're doing in an excavator, that's a good move. Paying attention to a lot of things is helpful. We can ignore some things. But can we just put out there for each other? One thing you don't want to close your eyes to. One thing you don't want to be blind to. And one thing you don't want to ignore is your life. Right? If there's one big thing we say, please don't ignore this, it would be your life. The meaning of it. The direction of it. Where it's going. If you're not willing to take a step back and ask, all right, how are things going? What's the fruit of my behavior? Is there any meaning to this? Am I finding significance? If you're not willing to take a step back and do a little evaluation of it all, Solomon has the word fool. You're being foolish. You're running through a room blindfolded at full speed. Right? You can't argue with that. Right? You're with Solomon. You're tracking with this. None of us ever says moron kept his eyes open the whole time. (laughs) Solomon is looking out saying we can't afford to not pay attention to life. To the pursuit of your life. And it goes like this. If we're willing to ask the tough questions, if we're willing to do some evaluations, if we're willing to look and actually see what the fruit of life is. It's not going to solve everything, but man, can you avoid some serious damage. Man, can you avoid some serious consequences of what sin can do in life by just keeping eyes open and saying, that's not good, that's not helpful, I'm choosing something else. But then he faces the biggest obstacle in life. And this is where it gets tough. Verse 15. Then I thought in my heart, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? And I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. For like the wise man, For the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. What haunts Solomon is that no matter what he does, no matter how wide his eyes are, no matter how wise he lives, no matter what he does, the fool down the road will be buried right next to him. Because the fate at the end is the same. So can you see how this might drive Solomon crazy? Literally crazy. He's searching after wisdom. He's trying to find it. He searches after meaning. He tests everything. He finally comes to the place of saying, well, you need wisdom. Like, don't be a fool. Be wise. That makes good sense. And then as he chases after that thought, he sees the roads converge. But even the wise man will suffer the same fate as the fool. What do you do with that conclusion? What do you do 
with that. How many of you, when you walk, any of you walk this cemetery over here ever? I know, yeah, a couple of, of us uh, walk through there for exercise or, or other. When you walk by a tombstone, do you have any idea what that life story was? Any idea if he was a successful dad or a delinquent? Any idea if he was a wealthy man? A wealthy man who did great things and invented some amazing things, or if he was a lazy man who quit his job and never went back to work? Do you have any idea of whether or not the woman was industrious and always applying herself and caring for neighbors, or if she was a selfish woman? No, right? Because the same fate awaits both. That's what Solomon is getting at. You can't see. You don't know. All are forgotten. So I told you, this is not going to be like the happy rainbow unicorn sermon. Right? I warned you about this. Stay with me for a bit more. How many of you, you don't need to raise your hand. How many of you have been affected by death in the past year? Yeah, pretty much all of us. How many of us are worried about death in the coming year? Maybe it's our own. Maybe the doctors that have spoken with us, it's not looking good. Or maybe it's someone we love. Maybe it's someone that we're praying for, but we're really concerned. Or maybe they've taken a turn and we kind of know what's coming this year. You see, culturally, we do everything we can to avoid the concept of death. I uh, support, encourage, cheer, um, fitness. I don't participate in it all that much. But I love to sit on the sideline and cheer you on as uh, you're doing it. I think that's good. I cheer on healthy Habits, being a good steward, eating healthy. Uh, I like that. I'm a supporter of that. But it doesn't avoid the end question. Because the road always will go to one place. The fate of the fool, the fate of the wise. And so we push death as far from our minds as possible. How many of you have a best friend? Who's always talking about death? No one, right? Good, thanks. You up, you upheld that theory for me. Because what would happen? Like, if we had a, a really good friend who was talking about death all the time, we'd probably go far from them. Or we would go to the doctors with them, get them some meds, you know, calm them down, it, it'll be okay. No, uh, people who tend to focus on that. Uh, They're bummers, downers. They need some help. But what if for a moment we don't avoid the topic? What if for a moment we let it sit right in front of us? And it doesn't matter whether we're kids or whether we're 20 or 40 or 60. the, The question still lingers out there for all of us. We could ignore it. But if we simply ignore and don't talk about the end of life and dying, Solomon says, well, that's what fools do. They just close their eyes and they race forward. And I don't want to be a fool. We could give up. And this sounds a lot like what Solomon is doing, right? We could just shrug our shoulders and say, ugh, then I'm done. It doesn't have any meaning and... Why should I care and why should I put effort forward? And if the same fate awaits both, then I'm done. I'm out. And it just doesn't matter what happens anymore. Or we could recognize it, take it into account, look it in the face, and let it affect our decision making on how we live life. That this gift God has given you on this earth 
it will not last forever. And beginning to take that into account begins to change some things we do, some values that we hold. If God has given me a certain number of days, certainly I should try to receive a heart of wisdom to make the most of those days, right? Jonathan Edwards, um, he had the, the super interesting habit. Jonathan Edwards was a real giant in church history here in America. And uh, one of the habits he had, he said he thinks about his death every day because it teaches him to live properly. So if a current theologian came out with that, no one would buy his book because it's not the happy rainbow and that's what we like. But Jonathan Edwards is someone that that holds such respect and high esteem to see that for him, looking it in the face every day changed him. It changed him to be a little more like Jesus, to be faithful living the days he had, to be living for generations coming behind him, right? If you've ever had a visit with a doctor that didn't go well and the question came out, how long do I have to live? If you've ever had a plane that had a lot of turbulence and you became fearful, if you ever had that near miss on the highway and you just had to pull over because you, you were breathing too heavy, if you ever brushed with death, it changes you. One of the ways it changes you is people become more important. If a dad had a, an experience um, and it just brought his mortality in front of him, when he comes home, that dad is different. He's on the floor playing with his kids and probably crying in joy playing with them. If a mom, a teenager, if any of us brush with it, it changes the decisions where all of a sudden people take the priority, right? Uh, those of you who have been there or have, have a, had a loved one face death know what I'm talking about. Someone who's dying on their deathbed, they do not ask for their time punch card to be brought to them. They ask for loved ones. Oh, you better call the family. The time's coming. Right? Because people take priority in that moment. Which begins to make sense. But this isn't the good news point. Because Solomon asks a question right here. Right in this conclusion. It gets tough, it just does, because he looks at people. He looks at living for the next generation. Those following, it comes a really tough, but a real conclusion. Well, these people, they may be fools and waste it all. All right? Even the happy place we're trying to go to, Solomon is going to undercut that. Uh, beginning in verse 18. Or verse 17. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I've poured my effort and skill under the sun. So this too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. And then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man gain? What does he get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work, his pain and grief, even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. 
If you take out Solomon's conclusions here with me, all right? If we hit that again, verse 19, and who knows whether he will be a wise man or fool, yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. Is that a legit thought? Yeah, yeah. We don't verbalize that. But yeah, that seems legitimate. I'm going to work and toil and give and love and serve and I don't know what's coming after that. Down in verse 21. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. Is that a difficult, not happy, but reasonable thought to have? Sure seems it. In verse 21, or 22, What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. How many of you stay up, stressed out, you can't stop your mind, you're thinking about it all, you're thinking about the problems, you're thinking about the future, you're thinking about the elections, you're thinking about your... And you just can't shut it down. I mean, I have those nights. So we swapped or bought some used furniture like a year ago. And uh, we had hand-me-down furniture before, and so now we had, like, newer hand-me-down furniture that we bought. So that was cool. That's, like, new to us. That, that's the definition of new for the little fields. So we were really excited. We uh, got rid of our um, old couch and old seat and uh, bought some from a neighbor that, that was replacing theirs. We're like, this is great, until the first night that I had one of those nights. Usually I sleep well, but if my mind kicks into gear, I don't. And it's, I'm restless, I'm awake for hours. So the first night that happened, my mind's going, I'm praying for you guys, I'm thinking about the future, I'm worried about the kids. You know, you know what I'm talking about, just spinning. And so I'm like, oh, I've got to go down to the couch. You know, sometimes a change of location can help, probably for you too. So I go downstairs and... Our couch is gone, but we have the new furniture, right? Didn't take into account that it's love seats. Yeah. So I'm laying on my new love seat with my head crooked up, my feet are up. I'm like, this isn't helping. <laughs> we all have those nights. Our, our minds are restless. Solomon did too. He takes it all. And he just asks. What's the point? Even passing to the next generation. What's the point? What's the point? Verse 24. How many of you love this verse? A man can do nothing better than to eat and have a home brew. That's a good Father's Day passage right there. Like, boom! Boom! There it is. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. Meaning, I want you to hear this this morning. There is significance out there. And Solomon knows it. But he can't find it on the path that he's taking. Solomon can't create meaning. He can't work for significance. He can't please himself enough to find it. He can't build enough wealth, pass along an inheritance big enough. He can't create the meaning for himself. And so he's coming to the simplest conclusion that you could ever imagine here. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This, too, I see. What would you expect to hear right there? Right? I mean, that, we've heard that phrase a few times. This, too, is meaningless, a chasing. But he doesn't. This, too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, 
who can eat or find enjoyment. And we finally come to a place in this journey where we begin to taste the grace of God in the simple endeavors of life. We receive. That's where Solomon finds himself in that verse. He's not going. He's not seeking. He's not striving. He's not chasing it. He's sitting back and saying, as a king of Israel, the wisest man in the world, and the wealthiest man around, find some significance in life. I need to have the grace to receive the simple things that God has given me. A meal with friends, a drink, the chirping of the birds outside, a graduation ceremony, a walk through the woods, watching how the gears work and enjoying it. That the simple things in life are some places that we find the grace of God most clearly. And this king says, what can you do better than to receive some basic grace-laden gifts from the Lord? We're going to see this conclusion several times over the weeks. Where I literally see Solomon after like all this work, just taking that deep breath and saying, it's got to come from the hand of my God. It's got to come from the hand of my God. I had one of those this week. I had one of those simple pleasures. Uh, Chris and Stacy invited us over to their house for Chris's 22nd birthday. It was great. <laughs> and uh, we're outside. It's been years since I played wiffle ball. And the kids and parents were dancing around turkey poop, playing wiffle ball in bare feet. It was great. And it was just this moment of exhilarance of, <sighs> thank you, God for handing out a piece of significance right here, right now. Sometimes the the simple gifts of grace are the most powerful one. I think Solomon is putting his arsenal of abilities, what he can do, down. And he's turning heavenward. heavenward. What makes any time significant? What makes this time or, or that time? Can I just say, significance comes... When the heavens explode into the earth, and earth and heaven merge, and we get a taste of eternity. Because if you take eternity out of the equation, none of it matters anyway. And so, we're all done. I'm closing up house. I'm checking out, finding a different job to go myself. If you take eternity out, if you take the resurrection out, if Jesus never rose from the dead, remember what Paul says? We are to be pitied above all men. Because it's a useless endeavor. If you take resurrection out, if you take eternity out, it doesn't matter. But with resurrection and with eternity, we have these awesome glimpses of God meeting with people, of heaven colliding with earth, and the simple pleasures of eating and drinking, and sometimes in the extraordinary things, like what we get to celebrate after church today. A baptism is the heavens exploding, saying, I love you and I'm well pleased with you. And we get to celebrate what Jesus is doing in lives around us. That's a moment of significance. Not because we're striving for it, but because God is handing it to us. Saying, here, be in this moment. Be pleased. One day, and this is a good promise we can end on. Death is this. Death is his unwelcome enemy, and it messed with Solomon, and it messes with us too, right? Those of us who have been through funerals that have been really hard this year, deep inside, there's like this this lion, this ferocious lion that wants to come out to say, I've had enough! This isn't right! But we tame that lion because we know it's part of life and... We need to help our family grieve and we don't want to stir people up. But isn't it true deep down inside, it doesn't matter whether that person is 101 or 60. 
all of us are like, no! You see, there is one. There is one who has gone through death and come to life victorious. King Jesus is his name. And he takes people like Solomon and people like me and people like you. And he drops in the significance to say, it's not just today. All right? I've done something about tomorrow too. I've done something about eternity. And in that resurrection victory, we're people who celebrate. Amen? We can see the insignificance. We can see the questions. We don't mind asking about death. We don't mind taking a tough trail. But at the end of the day, we're people who worship Jesus because He's king over death and He's given life and victory to His church to share out with the world. Even people like Solomon to say, we get it, Solomon. I feel that too. But I know one who you didn't. His name's Jesus. And he's changed it all. Let me invite our our worship team up. I want to encourage you. um, I don't know that we communicated super well that we're providing food. Did we get that word out? Uh, A few soft nods. That's sufficient. Um, Please stay. Please join us. Please celebrate with us um, as we have a baptism. Unfortunately, I think the weather, uh, well, I don't think I know the weather's going to pull us back to church. Please don't let those transition be moments that you're like, nah, I'm all right, and disappear on us. Be a part with us. Uh, these are the moments that we were built for, to celebrate Jesus, to enjoy life together. And Solomon tells us, right, there's nothing better for man than to eat and drink, and be merry. So guess what we're going to do after church today? We're going to have a baptism, and eat, and drink, and be merry. So, all right, let me uh, close us in prayer, and then you guys can take us. Father, I thank you that as your people, as people who have been forgiven by Jesus, we don't need to ignore or run away from the huge questions of life. Sometimes even the feeling of meaningless that that can saturate our culture and even penetrate our lives. Uh, God, I I pray that today, as we look at a pretty deep question about filling our hole and filling our need, uh, God, may you open your gospel wide to us. May you leak in heaven's joys right into our day. Lord, I thank you for what you have in store For the rest of this day, you are altogether good. And we trust you, not just with these days, but with life eternal as well. You're amazing. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.